could a card game be sort of like Magic the Gathering, but design opposite? The strength of a game like Magic is that it has an endless set of new cards. But could the strength of some other game be that it doesn't have endless new cards? At first glance, it's hard to imagine how such a game would remain interesting for years. But it's a question that I was obsessed with for almost 20 years now. So let me tell you what I did about it, how that turned out, and a new development. Customizable card games print more and more and more new cards all the time to keep things interesting, to shake things up. They kind of have to because that style of game can get a bit stale without all those new cards. Plus, anyone who's making that style of game can't help but print endless new cards because it makes, what, thousands of times more money than if they printed a complete game that stopped making new cards. But could it be done? Could a game that feels somewhat similar be designed around the concept of being a complete product, a product that would have a couple expansions at most, but that would remain interesting for a long time, for like at least 10 years or more. That's no easy feat. And if you don't know much about the style of game, you might think, what's the big deal? Sure, it's possible. But it is a big deal. To put this into perspective, many years ago, I bounced the idea of a high-ranking designer at Wizards of the Coast. That's the company that makes Magic the Gathering. And he was frankly stunned by it. He said he had no idea how he would achieve this if he were tasked to do it. He said that he loves this style of game and it has a lot of strengths, but it also has some weaknesses. And that is that if you have a given card pool, a fixed set of cards that everyone's making decks out of, that eventually that it gets kind of solved and stale. But why is this such a hard design problem? Other genres don't seem to struggle with it. Street Fighter is a great example. It's not just possible, but it's actually kind of common to find players who play just a single version of Street Fighter and just a single character in that version of Street Fighter for over 10 years, and they don't get bored of it. There's a lot to it. There's still plenty of interesting strategy and interesting gameplay for them to have even after that long with just one character. But in a card game like Magic the Gathering, that is not so common. You might find someone who plays a certain style of deck like Red Rushdown for many, many years, but not the same exact literal deck. They're switching in new cards and switching out cards as cards rotate in and out of the environment over the course of many years. But in the Street Fighter example, they're playing that same Ken or that same Blanca the whole time. So how do fighting games do it? I think a big factor there is just how big the possibility space is in a fighting game. You have dozens of moves and each of those moves can be done at different ranges and with different timings so that at any moment, the possibility space is just enormous. If you do a move from just a few pixels closer or farther, that can have a different result. Or if you do it just a 60th of a second earlier or later, that can have a different result. So when you take all of those possible spacings and all those possible timings and you multiply it by the pretty big palette of moves you have, there's just an enormous possibility space to play in. In a card game, you could play a card and have it be different depending on what other cards are in play at the time. I understand that, but that's orders of magnitude, fewer possibilities than what's going on in a fighting game. Card games are just a lot more discreet. This gave me an idea, and honestly, it's an idea that I regret having. I thought we could start with a card game that works vaguely similarly to how other customizable card games work. Then we could add a layer on top of that of a new resource that works in a different way than anything I had seen in any other card games. And something that was also on my mind at the time was how interactive counter spells are. You want to do something and I counter it and say you can't. There, we just interacted. So if we're getting the most interactivity from counter spell type mechanics, then we could use this new resource to do two things. One, you could spend it to counter anything the opponent's doing. And of course they could spend theirs to counter your counter. But two, you could also spend it to modify or juice up any card at all. What's really strategically interesting about this idea is that it's forcing players to really show how much they value every little thing in the game. This is a limited resource, so what do you want to use to juice up and make more powerful? And what do you want to stop them from doing? And if they want to spend their resource to stop you from doing a thing, is it so important that you need to spend yours to force it through? There's just a lot of great strategy opportunities that this opens up. Here's the issue. This style of game is already complicated before you add any of this stuff to it. So when you add a whole new layer of complexity to it, you're making it that much harder to learn, that much harder to get into and really wrap your mind around. And then on top of all that, you're adding a ton to the mental stack. 
that's the term for all the things that a player has to think about as they play. And you do want some mental stack. You wouldn't want players to have nothing to think about as they play. But there is a limit. When the mental stack gets too big, the game is just too damn hard to play, too unfun to play. I'll let you in on a little secret. It is not as hard as you think to make a game strategically deep. You know, it's not easy, but it it can be done. But it's really hard to make a game with any depth at all that doesn't hurt the tiny human brain, a game that humans will actually enjoy playing. And let me tell you, this idea wasn't it. This was not a theoretical idea. I mean, I actually played it many times. And one time when I was playing with a friend, I asked him afterwards, hey, do you want to play again, but this time without the extra resource that counters everything? And he gave out a sigh of relief and he said, thank God, yes, please, let's play it again without that. Because it was just so excruciating to play. Even to get through a single turn, we're constantly stopping each other at every little thing. Wait, maybe I'm going to counter that. Let me think about it. And it just, it took so long to get through a turn and it was so grueling. We were just exhausted by the end of it. Anyway, as I'm sure you can tell from that whole story, that whole approach did not pan out. But the thing that set me in the right direction was thinking about a different thing that sets apart card games versus video games. And that is how single-minded a deck really needs to be in a customizable card game. When you're building a deck, it's only so big. It only fits so many cards. And so there's only enough room to have one good strategy usually and just go all in on it. Just have everything you have amplify and help you land that strategy. That's not really how a fighting game character works, though. A fighting game character tends to be a lot more well-rounded. It can deal with a lot more things thrown at it than a customizable card game deck. And an even more extreme example is a real-time strategy game like StarCraft or WarCraft 3. Those games are like the complete opposite of an all-in strategy. I know I'm going to have to clarify that because you might be thinking, what do you mean you can't do an all-in strategy? There's plenty of all-in strategies in that style of game. Like, what about if you're Zerg and do a six-pool rush where you attack so early that you just beat the opponent right off the bat, but if they counter you at all, then you pretty much lose. You just went all in. Yes, yes, I know that, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the thing that you bring into the game. So in the card game, you bring a deck into the game, and that deck can really only do one strategy. But in a real-time strategy game, you're bringing a whole race into the game, like you're bringing Zur. That's what you pick at the beginning. And then at that point, you have a whole bunch of different strategies. And yeah, one of them is to go all in, but you don't have to do that every time. You can play Zerg for 10 years and you can do endless new strategies all the time, every time you play. So that's what I needed. And that reminded me a little bit of something called a sideboard in card games. That's where you have a few extra cards, like maybe 15 cards that are supplemental or to the side of your deck. And between games, like if I played you a series of games, after game one, I could substitute in a few of those 15 cards and substitute out some of the cards in my main deck and slightly adjust it. So there, you're getting a little bit of that StarCraft feel, but I need to go way further than that. Because in the sideboard case, you know, you're only changing a few cards and you're not really changing any of the cards in the very first game. This is only between games. This needs to be a dance that goes back and forth all the time. Every time we play, it needs to be integrated and like the centerpiece of the game. I worked on that idea for many years and it became the card game called Codex. Codex after the card binder that holds all of those cards that compose all those different strategies you can have every time you play. In Codex, just like in real-time strategy games like StarCraft or WarCraft 3, you're choosing that strategy as you play. It's unfolding as you play, and the same is true as the opponent. And then you can kind of adjust what you do based on what they're doing. There's a back-and-forth dance where each time you play, you could use entirely different units because they're part of a completely different strategy than the last game that you played. Another thing that's worth mentioning about Codex is the game flow. Earlier, I told you how absolutely terrible it was to try to get through even a single turn of that prototype game where we had that extra resource that could counter everything. It was awful because there were so many different things that you could counter the opponent doing that you had to constantly keep waiting on them. But in a real-time strategy game like Warcraft 3, you can destroy an opponent's tech building and then that stops them from making certain units for a while. And you can kill an opponent's hero, and then that stops them from casting the spells of that hero for a while until it's resurrected. In Codex, I made it work the same way. So you can counter people, in a sense, if you 
destroy their buildings or destroy their heroes that they need in order to make certain units or cast certain spells. But you never have to wait around for them to respond to anything, nothing in the entire turn. And it was pretty difficult to figure out how to make that work for combat, but it does. It uses a mechanic called the patrol zone. And I don't want to get into how that works here. I just want to note that you can get through your entire turn without waiting on the opponent at all. And yet it still has the ability to interact with them and counter the things that they're trying to do. So how did all this turn out? Well, after 10 years of working on Codex, I released it and I think it worked, meaning people liked it and it did achieve the goal of remaining interesting for many, many years, even when played by hardcore experts. So you could say mission accomplished, sort of, but there's some bad news. The bad news is that due to a series of unfortunate events, Codex is no longer in print, which means you probably can't buy it, or at least I don't have any copies to sell you. I do still have the print and play version, the digital files available for you to print and make your own copy, but it's not in print in the traditional sense, and that really sucks. And it gets worse, but it also gets better. It's going to remain out of print for years after I post this video, but the good news is that I have been working on a new version of Codex, a refined version. It mostly feels the same, but I've smoothed out some of the rough edges and I've made major advancements in making the rules cleaner and easier to understand. And there's also a new feature that adds a lot of variety each time you play it. And I really love this new feature, but I'm not ready to talk about it quite yet. I won't be able to release this new version as a finished tabletop product for many years. And I don't even have the money that I need to make the art for that new version. But in the meantime, I'm going to start rolling out a print and play version and also a virtual tabletop version for my patrons on Patreon. So you can join patreon.com slash Serlin to see that and participate in that. I'll be rolling out more content for it over the course of many months. By being a patron, you'll get to play with other patrons on our Discord, provide feedback and help make it a reality. And all the money raised is going to go to artists on my team. So if that interests you, you can join patreon.com slash Serlin and hopefully we'll see you in the patrons chat of our Discord. Or you could wait years from the posting of this video and hopefully I'll have a finished tabletop version of Codex available again.